Bokir Tov, Chavri Man, Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic segment of our broadcast today. And guys, Satan is fighting me this morning on this broadcast. I already filmed this thing so many times. The last one, 30 minutes into the broadcast, and I find out the, vo the batteries were dead in the, in, in the audio system. Oh, it's, a, it's an awesome message. You don't want to miss this. Friends, I also want to take just a moment. We try about two times a month, take one or two days there, and we ask and remind the people, those of you that, that God has laid it on your heart, you want to support this ministry. Uh, some of you write me because I don't say it every day. Uh, I, I don't like to do that. I don't like to dun people for money, but you can go to our website, israelinewslive.org or israelreturns.com. Yana, by the way, my wife is writing again on, on israelreturns.com, but there's a donation page, page, excuse me, a donation button on both pages. And you can give either way, online or if you prefer to mail, on israelreturns.com is a, uh, there is an address there where you can mail us here in the Czech Republic. Uh, and just make it out to Dununa Institute of Biblical Research. Uh, again, IsraeliNewsLive.org and IsraelReturns.com. God bless you. Thank you for helping us. It's what makes everything possible. By the way, it's been a very busy week. We've been in a lot of things dealing with all the tragedies throughout Europe, constant attacks by, the, uh, by different origins from the Middle East there, Syrians, Iranians, etc. The United States also being bombarded, but tonight... Uh, or today, I have to share with you, we're in Krakow, Poland. We're here to cover World uh, Youth Day. The Pope of Rome is here. Uh, we're covering what's going on there. Clearly, it's very, isn't, I, isn't it interesting to see how the Pope is kind of involved in everything dealing with a world issue behind it, World Youth Day, uh, the globalism, world uh, order, the uh, global... Um, uh, peace initiatives, the one world religion, everything. He seems to be the main guy in all of this. And it's no coincidence, guys. It's not a strange coincidence at all that he is involved in all of it. Now, before I get started with the broadcast, if you have a Bible, and I apologize for time's sake, I can't post the pictures on the, uh, the, the scriptures on the screen here because we are going out to cover what's going on with the Pope here, and I'm very pressed for time. So I want to share with you, though, quickly. Uh, have your Bible ready. Joshua chapter 2 is where we're going to start about Rahab. And you know I've been talking to you all week about Rahab. Quickly, though, let me take you here. Uh, something uh, that I wanted to share with you here. The Pope of Rome on Crux, uh, cruxnow.com, World Youth Day, uh, uh, Krakow, if you look it up like that in your search engine there, uh, July 27th, Pope Francis says the world is at war, but not a war of religions. Sure. He's, you know what? It's interesting. He's right. He has successfully brought back all of the harlot daughters back to Mother Church Rome. Now, before we go to Joshua, no, I, I, no we're going to go to Joshua. I, I, got, I got so excited earlier, I got to make sure I stay focused so I keep you in, in line here. In the King James Version Bible here, using the translation here, and Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shedem two men of, to, to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. All right. Now, I want to read that to you real quick in Hebrew. There is a reason for this. All right. It's just interesting. It's, it's, only, it's only a conjecture here, but I just want to share this with you. Ve'ishelach. Yeshua binun min hashatim shanim shneim anashim. Okay, and just like it reads in King James. All right, and and Joshua sent out the Joshua the son of Nun binun. That's where my name comes from, by the way. I just thought I'd throw it in there just for fun. There, a lot of our family on my father's side Jew, that are all Jewish descent believe that we were descendant of Joshua. Now, whether or not that's true or not, I don't know, because the interesting thing is, is nowhere in the Bible does it ever speak about Joshua getting married. That's an odd thing, but he is a son of Ephraim. He's a child or a descendant of Ephraim, uh, uh, and he comes from the tribe of Ephraim. But oddly enough, the Midrash, uh, the ancient sages, believed that Joshua married Rahab the harlot after she became a believer. Now, some people might say, well, wait a minute, Brother Steve. It says in the book of Matthew that Rahab had a different husband. Look closely at Matthew in Greek, though. Matthew in Greek, 
which is also one of the reasons why some people believe that Rahab was not a harlot. Matthew gives a genealogy, includes Rahab, but if you look over in the book of James and also in the book of Hebrews, both Greek, <coughs> Greek written uh, passages there, we find out that Rahab is mentioned as well there. In James, he says, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and had sent them out another way. <coughs> Now, Hebrews says, by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with, with them that believe not. Now, some scholars argue that the genealogy Rahab is a different Rahab. And the reason they argue that is because in Greek it's spelled completely different. And also there's no mention of a harlot, as James mentions, and also Hebrews. Now, Hebrews is believed to be written by Paul. There's also others that believe that it's actually Aquila uh, that wrote the book of Hebrews. <coughs> Interesting debate. Don't have time for that. We can go into that some other time. But it is a different spelling, so it is believed to be that it may be two different Rahabs. Uh, Rahab was a popular name back during that day. But the Jewish scholars and theologians from many years back have all held to that Rahab was actually the wife of Joshua. And from them descended uh, Jeremiah and even Hulda, the prophetess, the well-known prophetess of the Bible that prophesied uh, when the high priest was... was uh, came to her at the order of the king to find out what would befall Israel. So great prophets have proceeded from these two here according to what is believed. And again, I can only say it's a conjecture. I don't have any proof for that, but I think it is fascinating. Now, let's go back to uh, Joshua 1. The son of Nun, Joshua the son of Nun, uh, out of Shechem, two men to spy secretly, saying, View the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. A harlot's house. Now, that may seem like no big deal. And I've done many videos on the two witnesses. You can go on our YouTube page, look at the one that says two witnesses. I have series there. I have series on the, on the, on the Antichrist, etc. For those that don't know, check that out. Uh, and and so let's, way, go, let's go back into this. So Rahab. What do we have here? Rahab, the two spies go to Rahab, the harlot. Now, here's what's fascinating. Go to Revelation. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Revelation chapter 8, uh, 17. All right? In verse 5, and upon her forehead, let's, let's go back to verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations of filthiness of her fornication. All right? Verse 5, And upon her forehead was written the name written, <clears throat> excuse me, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Every ungodly thing has come from her. Now, some people say, oh, that's the United States. No. Mystery Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church. The daughter of Babylon is the United States. And of course, Jeremiah 51 does speak about bringing judgment upon the daughter of Babylon. This is the Babylon that Jeremiah speaks of that God will wipe out. That is the United States by extension. Why? Because the churches, the denominational systems, many of them, now I'm not talking about the early beginnings. I'm not talking about when Martin Luther protested the Catholic Church. Now, Martin Luther still had some ideas that were not very good. He still was burning women at the stake or consenting to it as well. You have to go back and read your history. You may not know that about Martin Luther. He still hated the Jews and said they should all be killed. All right? A true man of God shouldn't be talking like that. There's too many true men of God back in that day that didn't talk like that. But the Lutheran Church comes. Calvin, Finney, Knox, Wesley, John Wesley, etc., all, the, all these different, there were many men that loved the Lord. You know, I don't say that they were bad men, but then the, the systems as they grow, they get worse and worse and worse. They just become like their mother, a, a prostitute, a harlot. And, they're the, and, she, and the, great, the mother is the great whore, and she has harlot daughters. But the funny thing is, is the two spies were sent to a harlot. They went there and they lodged in a harlot's house. Joshua, by the way, friends, you guys know, Joshua is a type of Yeshua. He's a type of Jesus. Okay? And lodging in a harlot's house is what they did. They lodged there with Rahab. All right? So, 
But notice also the, the cup, the golden cup in her hand. Who stands there with the cup in his hand there on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, according to Obadiah's scripture, and is drinking down men only, according to the Hebrew language there. It was the Pope of Rome with his crown on. There, and what is it? Their church is decked in gold and precious stones. Above a, a, a painting of Mary inside of St. Peter's Basilica, huge diamonds go across her head in the stars to represent the apostles. Diamonds, gold, everything. Oh my gosh, friends. All right, so we see the harlot is here. That is what it is. And so what happens? The two witnesses go, or the two spies go unto the harlot's house. Now James calls them messengers. In Revelation, or excuse me, in Joshua, there, 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 there's two spies, or two men, Shnei and Ashim, or Shnaim and Ashim. Two men go to spy out the land. But James called them messengers. And that's exactly another way that God refers to the two witnesses. Now, all right, now, gosh, I wish we wouldn't have lost the, the, the audio of the first one. It was really, it was blessing me, in fact. All right, so what happens? They go there, and let me just click on it real quick here. Joshua chapter 2, verse 2. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight, of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which entered uh, into thine house, for they come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said, Thus there came men unto me, but I was, was not whence they, whence they were. In other words, she didn't know where they were from. All right, so she hides them. I believe today the two witnesses, guys, are alive and well, and yes, they were inside of the harlot's house. They were there. What is, what is God waiting on, though? God is, or what are they waiting on? They're waiting upon God to anoint them with the Holy Spirit in power in order to go forth and to not only preach the gospel to the Jews, but to call out Rahab and her family from that harlot house. That is what God has laid on my heart to share with you guys. And, oh gosh, let's take a look at this. Now, we see that. Now, notice, though, watch what the, watch what the king says. King of Jericho, behold, there came in men hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. Go to Psalm 83. All right, let's, let's take a look at Psalm 83. I've got to share with you something here. All right. In Psalm 83, what does it say? Keep thou not silent, O God. Hold not thy peace and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make atonement. They that hate thee have lifted up the head. That's their world leader. All right. Now, Psalm 83 is not a war. Psalm 83 is a confederacy before the war. Ezekiel 38 is the war. Psalm 83 is what they're doing beforehand. We're living in Psalm 83 right now. Psalm 83 is being fulfilled before your eyes. Now, watch what happens here. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. What did the king of Jericho do when he came to Rahab? The Israelites have sent in a couple of men. He's already taken the counsel. Now he's coming to try to deal with them. He wants to know where they are. Now watch, that, watch what else it says here. They've taken craftily counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. Sufanecha. Sufanecha was the Hebrew word that was used there. The hidden ones. Who are the hidden ones? It's your two witnesses. I'll never forget it. I've said it in many videos. Chuck Missler, walking down. We, I did an interview with him many years ago. Walking down hallway with him, he specifically asked me about that scripture. Steve, what do you think about Joshua, the two hidden ones? Or the hidden ones. He didn't say two. He said, what do you think about the hidden ones? He said, do you think that that's the raptured saints? At the time, I did not know. I'll confess and tell you true. But when God revealed it to me, without, like a week later, God revealed it. And I sent Chuck an email. And I told him, I said, Chuck, it's not the raptured saints. It's the two witnesses. Who, are, who is hidden right now? Now, some believe, okay, and I'll just settle this real quick. Some believe, oh, Brother Steve, no, it's Elijah and it's Enoch because they never died. And that's the argument. You say, use the scripture. It's appointed a man once to die and after this, the judgment. Go back to that chapter. It's appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment. It doesn't make sense if you apply it using it as far as justifying, well, Enoch and Elijah have never died. They got to come back and die. That doesn't make any sense at all because the scripture says it's appointed once for man to die. So, in the case of Lazarus, he was born, died, born again, died again. All right, so it makes no sense, right? 
The whole chapter is dealing with Jesus and his death that he only has to come and die once. It has nothing to do with you as an individual, dying or not dying. And therefore, that throws, because here's what's funny. Most people that hold that as a scripture for Elijah and Enoch to be the two witnesses are also those that believe in a rapture. And if you believe in a rapture, well, then you're not going to die at all. So when do you come back and die? You see what I'm saying? It makes no sense to apply that. And the passage has nothing to do. Read it. Most of you guys are not reading the entire passages. You heard somebody teach Enoch as one of the two witnesses, and I'm not against that. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus that believes that. I love you just the same. I'm not like that. I'm not the type that, oh, if you say, I don't believe in the rapture, I hate you. I don't, I'm not like that at all. Oh, I believe in the rapture. I hate you. No, I'm not one of those type people at all. I love you regardless of what your doctrine is. I'm only trying to help and open up light where I can. All right. Moses never fulfilled many of his own prophecies. All right. Example. Give you an example here. Let me take, take you to the Hebrew language. Uh, one of the prophecies that he's never fulfilled. All right, let's go, let's go back into the uh, memory Bible here. It's online. It's the Hebrew version for those of you that want to do that. Exodus, Shemot is how we say Exodus in Hebrew, and it actually means names. It doesn't mean Exodus. It doesn't mean coming out. That's funny. It should be Yotze if it's going to be Exodus, but it's not. All right, it's Shemot uh, 15. All right, here it is. Verse 1. All right. Az Yashir Moshe uvenei Yisrael et hashira hazot lahiwa. All right, now... I can't say that God's a divine name, so we'll just put Ladonai in there. And anybody that says, oh, we know the divine name of God. You know, I've got a wonderful brother, Brother Nehemiah Gordon, and he believes that he has unraveled his name. I don't agree with that. God has said in Zephaniah that when Jerusalem is surrounded with the armies, then he's going to return a pure language for the people to call upon the name of Hashem, God's divine name, yod heh then we will know that pure name, all right? But looky here. It says right here, Az Yeshia Moshe uvenei Yisrael, all right? Then, or then sang Moses to the children of Israel, et hashira, this song hazot to, to the Lord, and this is what the song uh, was about. He says, veyomru, and he says to them, lemor, ashira ladonai ki ga'agao sus verekevo rema beyom, all right? He's saying right here, I will sing. Ashira. That is future tense, guys. No way around it. In the future. Uh, to the Lord. Kigaago. He says, I'm going to sing to the Lord that I have thrown the horse and his rider into the sea. Now, that is not susim verkevim. That's verkevo. His rider. Sus. One horse. The four, ride, oh, four horses of Revelation, the same man rides each horse, but it was down through different stages that it's ridden. The horse is ridden in different stages. In other words, that same man that rides him, which is the Antichrist, he rides the, uh, the black horse, he rides the white horse, the white horse first, then I uh, forget the, the, the order of the colors there, but the white horse first. See? He ends up on that grizzled looking horse there is all mixed with colors and everything that's the antichrist spirit antichristo meaning uh like christ someone that is pretending to be like christ and this is exactly moses says he's going to sing to god when he's done what he's thrown that the last horse that he's on and that rider is riding that's when the two witnesses appear on the scene and moses gets the victory over that horse and over his rider imagine that you see? So see, that, and that's just one, guys, one. You know, another one is where in Exodus, uh, I believe it's, let me just look here, Exodus chapter 3. Let me see if I can find this one real quick for you as well. All right, and this is where, okay. All right. Veta, veta lacha, wait a minute. Okay, uh, verse 11, I believe, is in K KJV. I don't have it in front of me. Ve'yomer Moshe el ha'elohim. Okay, and Moses says to God, Mi anochi ki elach el paro. All right. Uh, oh, wait a minute, no, that's not the one I wanted. That's where he's talking about going to Pharaoh. Uh, okay, here it is, here it is. Here it is. It's verse 13, I'm sorry. Ve'yomer Moshe el ha'elohim hine anochi. All right, and he says, and, and that's basically saying, and, and Moses says to God, uh, Behold, if uh, uh, 
I, I, I will come unto the children of Israel, lahem, and I'm just translating this uh, off of my brain here, so forgive me if, I, if it's not exactly the way you see it in your Bible. Ve'amati uh, lahem, and Elochai um, avotechem, uh, and I will say to them that the, that the, the God of your fathers has sent me, shalachani aleichem unto you, ve'amruli, this is it, ve'amruli, and they will say to me, mashimo, what is his name? Ma'omer Elohim. See, what do I say to them? And then God says, Ve'yomer Elohim el Moshe, Ihaye asha ihaye, Ve'yomer ko ta'amar levne Yisrael, Ihaye shalachani aleichem. All right, now what is he saying right here? He says, you will say to them, Ihaye asha ihaye. Now here's what's interesting. I got a couple of emails recently. Two different people write me the same question. Brother Steve, what does Ihaye asha ihaye really mean? Now, this is interesting because I, I study this very deep anyway because I know Jehovah's Witness people believe Ihaye. They know it's future tense, and it's right, it is future tense. We translate it, I am that I am. All right? But even the, the JW people, they believe uh, it, it, it says that I will prove to be that I, that I, I am or something like that. All right? Actually, Haya is will be. All right? Ihaya. Okay, I will be that which I will be. It is a prophecy speaking of the coming of the Messiah. It is a prophecy that Yeshua will be manifested. He will prove, he will be. He says, I will be that which I will be. He proved who he was when he came down there with the signs and wonders, parted the Red Sea, brought the plagues through Moses. He proved it then. But he does it in a, in, in a future tense. Why? Because Moses has still yet to fulfill because the, the question was never asked. They never asked Moses, Mashimo, what is his name? But the thing is, is the divine name must be restored. And Moses is the guy with the name. Moses knows God by his name. Moses knows that it was a future prophecy of the coming of the Messiah and he's going to reveal the Messiah to the Jewish people of today as well as restore that divine name so that we all may call upon the great name of Almighty God in the right proper tongue. My gosh, guys. See, see, this is my point. There are so many scriptures that have yet to be fulfilled by Moses. Even I think it's another one in uh, Deuteronomy 32 where God says he'll do great wonders with him. And even the rabbis say, it never happened like that. So they changed it and said, he'll do great marvels. No, he will do great, a terrible thing with Moses. A great thing, greater than everything, anything he'd ever done. Oh my gosh, friends. So see, Moses has got a lot to do. Now, Revelation 11. Let's jump back over here to Revelation 11. Because see, Psalm 83. Notice, Psalm 83, there is a confederacy. They're confederate against thy people. It's against Israel. They consulted against thy hidden ones, the two witnesses. And that's exactly what we see in the, in the case of uh, Joshua chapter 2. Rahab is hiding them. Okay? Rahab has hidden those two witnesses. So they were hidden Notice they were hidden amongst the stalks, the flax. i got to search that deeper. Maybe there's something even in that I've not checked out yet. But they're hidden. That's how you know the hidden ones are the two witnesses or the two spies. Because Rahab has hidden them in her roof. And what have they come? What has is, what is, uh, the king done? He's, trying, he's got a confederacy. He's trying to get rid of those two witnesses. And that's what, the, that's what they're doing today. Don't think they're not trying to figure out how to deal with the two witnesses. Oh, they try to say the Pope of Rome is one of the witnesses now. That's another Catholic theology, but he's not. He's not. All right? So, all right, uh, Revelation, uh, let's drop over here. Revelation chapter 11. Okay? Now, remember, they're going to appear at the time when the temple is about to be built. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles. All right, now I've always known that the Catholic Church for three and a half years is going to tread down that entire area. Now say, it says Gentiles, nations actually here. And that's because why? They're going to make, the United Nations is going to take control of Jerusalem. They're going to build a third temple on the Temple Mount. According to Rabbi Glick, and uh, Pastor Bagley says this here, quotes him, 
that they're going to make a museum between the Dome of the Rock and the Third Temple, and it'll be for all nations. Could that be that scripture there? Leave out that outer court. It's given unto the Gentiles. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 2,300 three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, most everybody agrees that Jesus is that golden candlestick. He is the menorah, right? Everybody, most every Christian believes that. Then why do you try to put Enoch in there with Elijah? All right, because the two olive branches standing on either side and on Mount Transfiguration, Yeshua is standing there, and here Moses and Elijah are alive standing on either side. Again, like I said, you can't use the scripture that states in there that for it's appointed to one man to die, and after this, the judgment. It all applies to Jesus, that scripture. It was applying to him coming and only having to die once. He didn't have to die twice. It wasn't speaking about you. It's speaking about him. And even, notice, in the New Testament, Michael the archangel disputes, or, or excuse me, Mo, uh, Satan disputes with Michael the archangel over the body of Moses. Where is it at? He's the angel of death. Isn't he supposed to set the corruption in on the body? Do you know? That's another question Chuck Missler asked me. He says, what was that all about? And then again, I didn't have the revelation at the time, but then God revealed to me why they, he was disputing with him. Because Moses' body didn't see corruption, and neither was the Messiah supposed to see corruption. And when Yeshua rose from the dead and his body did not see corruption, then he disputes with Michael the archangel because Moses' body never saw corruption, and he had got it mixed up. Praise God. Guys, why do you think Yeshua had a crown of thorns on his head? He was showing that the same God that spoke from the midst of a thorn bush to Moses on Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb was the same God that was in that human body. You know, I know that Jesus is the Son of God, okay? I know that. But inside of that flesh that he was in, it was, it was the I am. It was who we call, many people call him Yahweh. It was Yahweh inside of that body. And in the midst of the thorn bush, the crown of thorns on his head, he was speaking in an unknown tongue. Oh my gosh, friends. I'm so excited. Anyway, so there are the two olive trees. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of his mouth. Like Elijah called the fire down and it destroyed the enemies. Not that it's like they're dragons, okay? Uh, they, they're going to preach three and a half years. They turn the water to blood. They, they, they bring about all kinds of plagues. Now, I brought this out for a reason. In Revelation 18.4, this is why I wanted to bring Rahab on the scene here for you. It says in Revelation, let's start with verse 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now notice he says, is fallen, is fallen. This happens, I believe, three times in Scripture. Why is it two times, is fallen, is fallen? Because it's the United States in Jeremiah 51. And then it'll be Rome. After the death of the two witnesses, that one is destroyed as well. But watch what happens. It's not a chronological sequence here, guys, so watch this. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The wine, Obadiah, all right? There's a man drinking on my holy mountain. The Pope of Rome comes, and it says in Obadiah, all right, let's, let's oh guys, I got to say it to you. I got to show you. Obadiah, there's only one chapter, verse 16. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. All right? Now, hold that in thought. I'm going to take you back to the Hebrew version of this. You've got to see this in Hebrew because it doesn't make sense to you guys in English. Um, not that you have to be a Hebrew scholar or nothing like that. It's just, you know, guys, it's just little blessings, things that go you know, allows us to see that we can bless you with, you, don't, you know, God's going to restore pure language so you can worship him in. So don't worry about any of that, all right? So anyway, we get down here to verse 16. Okay, kika asha shutetem, all right? Shutetem al ha kodeshai. Okay, the ha kodeshai is the whole, or al ha is upon 
uh, the holy mount, my holy mountain, Kodeshi, Kodeshi, the Yod at the end being my, my holy mountain. Kika Asher Shutetem. That is masculine plural. All right, for as uh, you, and that is a plural you, all right, have drunk upon my holy mountain. Men only, guys. The Pope of Rome during Passover 2014 comes and only a men-only delegation in the upper room above King David's tomb, he puts on his triple crown showing that he is the king of Israel and he drinks in upon God's holy mountain and he drinks there with a men-only delegation showing that he's what? He's taking the place of Christ. He did men-only to show that those were his apostles. All right? Now, then it says... Uh, Isha tukul hagoim, and they, and this is gender inclusive. The rest of the nations, they will continue to drink. All the nations called tamid. That's tamid is for the word continue. You will continually veshatu alu vehayu kolo hayu. Okay, and they will be as though they were not even. They're going to, in other words, they're going to die for it. And they did. They continually did have communion services there in, on Mount Zion. Now, we know it's Mount Zion because in verse 17 it says, uh, 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 Sion. See, upon Mount Zion, but, or but in Mount Zion. All right? So this is how we know these things about what it is and what's going on. So they have drunk. So now we see that she has drunk. Uh, the bat, or say so. Uh, that was actually in Revelation 17. Let me just back that up so you know that. Uh, and the woman was arrayed in purple, verse four, uh, chapter 17. Scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Upon her name, forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations. The harlots, Rahab. Remember, Rahab was a harlot. The spies were hidden by the harlot, all right? So the churches are hiding today. People that are part of a harlot system are hiding who the two witnesses really are, okay? It's hidden there. It's a mystery hidden there, all right? Let me just say it that way. Now, in verse 8, chapter 18, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, all right? There again, you just saw that in Obadiah. They continually drink. It, Obadiah tells you who it is. It also calls it Esau. They can't get into that now, though, guys. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The kings of the earth. That's why the United States is involved. That's why the EU is involved. That's why all these nations that are drinking with the, with the wrath of her fornication. And the merchants of the earth all wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. See? Because she's the mother of the harlots, and the harlots are the ones that control the United States. Now watch what he says in verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and you receive not of her plagues. Revelation 11, the two witnesses bring the plagues. But there's a group that calls them out. Joshua chapter 2. See, notice the two witnesses were sent to spy out the land, but they resided in Rahab the harlot's house. What happens later? Now, I want you to see something. God's just revealing something to me right this moment. God, have mercy on me. Help me, Lord, to get the people to see this. Revelation, chapter 18. Listen closely, guys. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Another voice. The two spies go down to Rahab. Joshua is a type of Jesus, Yeshua. Now, chapter 6, verse 17, and the city shall be accursed, and it shall be, okay, and only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that, went, that we sent. Okay, now, let me read it on down for you. And ye and uh, any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, all right? But, and Joshua said, dropping down to verse 22, And Joshua said unto the two men that had spied out the country, 
Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath as you swore unto her. Joshua gave the command for the two witnesses to bring out out of the harlot's house those that would believe. You understand? You getting that now? Revelation. All right. Revelation 18. And I heard another voice. That's the voice of Yeshua, the voice of Jesus. See? See? From heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive in her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. The two witnesses are sent to the harlot's house to bring out the true believers that are tied up in these churches. At the command of Yeshua, at the command of Jesus, when that voice from heaven will speak and say to those two witnesses, go get them and bring them out. A voice out of heaven cried out, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. Who? The harlot's house. It's the job of the two witnesses when the voice from heaven speaks and says, go call her out. Not only will they prophesy in Jerusalem, in the streets there, not only will the very... Do you know, by the way, that it's on Mount Zion is where the ministry of the two witnesses will begin? I don't have time to look it up now, guys. Gosh. Now, quickly. So we came here to Poland, to Krakow. The Pope of Rome in the Crux magazine says, Pope Francis says, the world is at war, but not a war of religions. Isn't it interesting now, though, as I've shared with you about Rahab, how that Yeshua calls out a voice from heaven, says, come out of my people. What did Joshua says? And by his way, his name, Yahshua, almost identical to the spelling of Yeshua, it actually has the same meaning. Yeshua, God is my salvation. He calls out what? He calls out the true believers from the harlot's house. What is it? What did Paul say? I've espoused you unto Christ, a chaste virgin. Paul was doing the calling out in his day. So was Peter, James, John, the apostles, all those back then. Today, he's sending two witnesses to call out the bride for Christ. No wonder why the sages believe that Rahab married Joshua. What happens when they come out of her? They're going to a marriage supper and they're going to marry the very one that sent the voice to come out of her. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. God bless you. Thank you for watching. I'm in awe still. I'm still in awe. I love you. Thank you for being a support to this ministry as well. IsraeliNewsLive.org and IsraelReturns.com Don't forget my wife has started writing again on her blog on IsraelReturns.com.